So welcome back. Now we are in this uh, third part about cloud storage. So I already asked you the question. So now what's going to happen uh, is that we are going to start looking at uh, how we solve problems, right? And one of the problems we want to solve is imagine we want to query data. That's astronomical data. That's uh, the map of the universe that was done between 2014, 2020. I went to the website and I looked at the data. And I realized there's 273 terabytes of data that you can download. And it's in 680,000 directories, 176 million files. That's a lot of directories and files. Uh, so it has uh, hundreds of millions of stars and galaxies, uh, billions of objects and so on. But the first thing you notice in here is that this is so much data that you cannot put it on your laptop, right? It doesn't fit. And since a relational database is on a single machine, then it means you cannot use that either, right? So the question we ask is how can we store 200 terabytes of data and hundreds, uh, 100 million files? How do we do that? How do we store it? Um, so we've looked at relational databases. These are on a single machine. A single machine has only up to, let's say, 30 terabytes, let's say, so that's not enough. So the first thing we uh, note here is we need several machines. That's in any case. Um, but I have good news for you, because even though we are going to have to um, move to something completely different, something that is uh, that uh, that uh, has never been seen before with the good old relational database management systems, the good news is we can still reuse a lot of the teachings of these uh, of these systems. So I would say I would be even as bold as to say that 99% of what we've learned uh, can be reused. So what I told you on selection, projection, grouping, sorting, joining, it's still going to be there, even when you have hundreds of terabytes of data. A table with rows, columns, primary keys, when it still exists, you can still consider tables like that at these scales, even with the three rules implemented, that also works. You can choose to break them, but you can also choose not to break them, right? So that still makes sense. Then languages like SQL, we'll see it still makes sense. The notion of declarative language, functional language still makes sense as well. The notion of optimization of query plan, the Greek letters, the query plan indices, the alphabetical list at the end of the book, all of that still makes sense. That is great news because it means that everything you've been learning in your bachelor's lecture on relational databases still makes sense and can be taken to that domain of, uh, of big data. That is excellent news, right? But there's a few things that we are not going to be able to take to that domain. So I already told you, so that's not news normally to you, uh, this integrity constraints so or relational integrity, I also call it tabular, that's relational integrity, domain integrity, atomic integrity, we can throw them away, right? So this will consider systems that don't have them, that's no SQL. Uh, the second normal form, third normal form, Boyce-Code normal form, so Boyce-Code is 3.5 normal form, all of that can go away, right? Um, what we'll have, however, is the notion of heterogeneous data. Right, data that doesn't even have a schema. We'll have the notion of nested data. That's the one that breaks. So heterogeneous data can be seen as breaking the, the first two uh, things. So relational integrity, domain integrity, then it's heterogeneous. Nested data can be seen as breaking atomic integrity because you have tables in tables and more generally the notion of denormalized data. So that word denormalized, you're going to hear it a thousand times during that lecture, right? We're going to to massively denormalize data, right? So we'll reuse a lot, but there's a few things that are going to feel a bit different because of the scale that we are going to be looking at. But nevertheless, we will keep in mind a few um, architectural principles in the way that, uh, that, that uh, things are uh, uh, built. Uh, in the 1970s, the relational databases are considered monolithic. It means it's a single piece of software you install on your laptop or your server, and that's it, on a single machine. We are going to rebuild the same thing in a modular way, the same thing, but in a way that runs on a data center. And we'll want a lot of things in there. We'll want storage, syntax, data models, validation, uh, uh, processing, indexing. Uh, what did I write in there? Uh, data stores, querying, uh, user interfaces, and so on. We basically are going in the semester to work, work our way up that stack 
and reinvent all of these components in a way that at the end, we more or less get the same functionality plus minus. So these are the things that might differ, but we are going to rebuild that whole stack. So today we are going to talk about storage with local file systems. Uh, uh, HDFS is going to be the week after that, S3 Azure Blob Storage. We're going to be looking at uh, encoding very quickly, just that the way when you store files on storage, you can encode them in various, way, various ways. Then you have syntax, CSV is for tables, XML JSON for trees, RDF is for uh, uh, graphs, Turtle is also for graphs, XBRL is for cubes. So we look a little bit at syntax. Data models, we'll look at tables. We already looked at tables, but we'll also look at trees, at graphs, at cubes, so a lot of uh, different uh, shapes of data. Then we'll go into validation. We'll look into XML schema, JSON schema, JSONs, relational schemas. That's what we already know. It's the columns and types of uh, that you have in there. XBRL taxonomies for data cubes. So this is going to be validation. Then we'll look at processing. It's probably the coolest part of the lecture because this is when the data center is set into motion with MapReduce. Who heard of MapReduce? Who heard of Apache Spark? Okay, this is what we are going to look at. Now we are going to play with the data in the data center. Okay, uh, then the indexing, it's pretty much the same as in a relational databases, but we'd still rehearse them a little bit with uh, B trees, B plus trees, hash indices, and so on. Uh, then there's data stores. A data store is basically like a mini database system. It's not quite a full-fledged database system with ACID uh, guarantees and with a high-level language and so on. It's kind of a mini version of that, that might have an API rather than a query language, that might uh, not be fully ACID. Uh, and uh, we'll also discuss these things, but at least it's already a system that is integrated and that works out of the box. Uh, then you have the querying layer that makes it a true database uh, system. Uh, SQL, we are brushing it up. JSONIC, we look at it. XQuery is the same for XML. Nickel, MDX is for cubes. Sparkle is for graphs. Uh, so we look at uh, also querying aspects. And finally, user interfaces, it's uh, like when you use uh, uh, different ways of uh, accessing the system, like a spreadsheet. Microsoft Access, Tableau, ClickView, BI tools. I should have put ChatGPT in there as well because this is the direction that this is taking, right? You have an LLM and the LLM is interacting then with an underlying layer, right? We are not quite there yet, as you know, but in the moment that we actually do manage to connect LLMs to systems like this that provide reliable data, then that will be a, a, a really good step uh, forward, all right? Okay, and today we focus on storage, and then that's going to be the rest of the semester for the, the rest of the stack, right? So we'll have 13 weeks left to cover all of that. Okay, but we'll take it step by step. Now it's a regular lecture, regular material, so I'm going to go through it uh, slowly. So that's the first problem we try to solve. How do we store the data? All of these uh, stars and galaxies that are taking hundreds of data. Well, we need to put it somewhere, right? It needs to go somewhere. There is this saying that uh, quantum information people like to say that information is physical, right? You need to store information. It has to be on some physical layer with in the end atoms and molecules or light. Okay, so it needs to be stored somewhere. Now we will see during this course that there are two main paradigms to store the data. One paradigm is the one you have in PostgreSQL. You need to import the data into the database. You have SQL commands for that, right? It's called ETL. We'll come back to that, extract transform load. You load the data into the database and the database system takes care of the rest. So if you load it into PostgreSQL, you don't have to worry about how PostgreSQL is going to put it on the disk because that's taken care of. It's invisible to you. That is the traditional approach to storing the data, right? You import it and then let the system take care of it. Another way to look at data that is a bit more modern is the concept of a data lake. Who already heard of a data lake? Right? Okay, many of you. So the idea of a data lake is that instead, instead of importing the data into a system and letting the system worry about how to, to store it, when in a data lake, you directly store the data in a file system. These are files. So you store XML files, JSON files, CSV files, all you want. You directly store it on a data lake and you see them as files and directories. So this is called the data lake approach. It's very convenient if you only want to read the data. 
if you want to modify the data, you quickly notice that this starts breaking and it's not very convenient, right? But for read intensive setups, OLAP, we love data lakes for that for that reason, right? So examples, if you look at uh, using Pandas with Python, you are in fact using the data lake approach, right? Uh, it's also called in situ. It means that you put the data and you query it where it is without the need to import it. Okay, we have a question, yes? Yeah, almost. Um, so my question is, why is the data lake uh, so difficult to modify? Like you said, it's difficult to modify, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So the, uh, the reason it's difficult to modify is related to the question you asked earlier about consistency. It has to do with uh, the fact that if you put the data on a data lake, and let's say you put CSV files, XML files, JSON files, and all, all kinds of files, then you have direct access to these files. So it's very easy to get it wrong when you actually, you could make them inconsistent, you could make mistakes that uh, it's a lot on your shoulders. The other aspect is that you might have a, a very large file and you might want to modify one piece of data in that file, right? Let's say you have a gigabyte file and you want to modify something in that file. We'll see that the large scale systems that we're going to look at, the data lakes, they are really, really, really bad at modifying data like this in a random access fashion. They're really bad at that. They are really good at writing down the data. You stream a, a, a big file, you stream the data over and write it down. They're really good at that, but modifying data somewhere, they are not good at it. And that I will explain la, uh, next week uh, when we study HDFS, why that is the case, that it's very difficult to modify the data in place. And the third reason why it's difficult to modify the data uh, is that you might have multiple people trying to access the data at the same time, right? And then you really need to be on that side of things with a, a, a traditional system if you want to handle multiple users and transactions and ACID uh, and so on, right? Does it give you an intuition? A bit? Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. So that's something you really need to keep in mind the whole semester, the distinction between the systems in which you have to import the data and they figure out how to store it, but then they will give you a lot of very nice features. And data lakes that, um, uh, that you just directly drop your files on it and, uh, and then directly query them where they are. It's a bit tougher to use, uh, but, uh, but also quite popular. And we'll see the pros and cons on both sides. Uh, by the way, also to complete my answer to your question, there is a system that allows you to make updates to a data lake that's called the Delta Lake. Who already heard of the Delta Lake of Databricks? Right? So th this is something that they did. It's a very complex uh, machinery to, to do that, right? Just to say that it's challenging. Okay. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on Data Lake. How do we just drop the data in there and uh, have a system where we drop the data? Well, back in the 70s, we had the hard drives, right? Like this. Oh, that's the break already. So uh, let's take, uh, oh, wait, before you go, we have ETH juniors. Um, so you're free to go on the break if you want. If you're interested in hearing about ETH juniors, then, uh, uh, then this is for you. We'll also have uh, next week, I think is the analytics club. So it's just to give you an overview of uh, what's going on at ETH. Yes? And I'll see you otherwise at uh, quarter past uh, three. <laughs>